Hello and welcome back to this low-level JavaScript series on building a 16-bit virtual machine from scratch. In this episode, we're going to be looking at memory mapped I.O. and how this interesting technique can give us an easy way to use reading and writing to the address space for much more than just memory. What you're seeing now on the terminal screen is the very first real output from the VM. It might not look like much, but the machine can actually communicate with the outside world now. And even using this very basic display, we can imagine starting to build something like a very simple game. The best thing about it is that the CPU doesn't even know there is such a thing as a terminal screen. All it's doing is reading and writing to memory. We're going to dive into exactly how this works in a moment, but the basic idea is this. Our CPU is now connected directly to memory. It can read a value by asking the memory for whatever is at an address. And it can write to memory by providing an address and a value. What we're going to do is to put a layer in between the CPU and the memory, which we'll call the memory mapper. Just like the name implies, it maps memory addresses to devices. Those devices might be our CPU, our memory, which is essentially RAM, or it might be something else entirely like an output device. Our address space is 16-bit, which means there are FFFF uniquely addressable bytes. Using the memory mapper, we can divide the address space up between the different devices as we see fit. To start out, we'll have to make a few small changes in the CPU class. First of all, we're going to have to change the stack and the frame pointer starting addresses to a hard-coded value, instead of being calculated on the size of memory. This is because the CPU is no longer going to know exactly how much memory is available. It's going to get all of its information from the memory mapper. At some point, we should think of a better mechanism for defining where the stack starts, but for now, we'll just place it at FFFE. The second thing we need to do is to fix a small bug that I introduced in the last episode when I added the fetch register index method. The add instruction was still multiplying the index by 2, but this is actually taken care of by the method itself. This is a pretty good argument for writing tests which will prevent these kind of bugs from occurring. If you're interested in contributing tests, you can find links to the GitHub repo below. Next, we'd like a machine to be able to run its whole program without having to step through each instruction. So I'm going to add a method here at the bottom called run. The run method is essentially a recursive call that steps the CPU and then uses its return value to know whether or not to halt the machine. If it shouldn't halt, we'll schedule the run method to be called again in the next cycle of the event loop. We'll use set immediate here, which is a lot like set timeout, but much faster and connected to the way that the JavaScript engine internally schedules code to run. But of course, we need an instruction to be able to halt the machine. We'll call that instruction HLT for halt, which simply returns true. This should be the only instruction that ever returns true. And of course, we'll need a corresponding entry in the instructions.js file. To model our memory mapper, we're going to create a new file called memorymapper.js, where we'll create a class of the same name. In the constructor, we'll keep track of an array called regions. In order to create a region, we'll use a method called map. Map is going to take three arguments, the device, the start address, and the end address, and then a fourth optional argument called remap. We're going to pack all of those up into an object, which we'll call region, and unshift it into the regions array. It's important that we use unshift instead of push, because it means that when we search through the array to find a region, we'll find the regions which were most recently added. Finally, from this method, we can return a function, which when called, will remove the region object from the regions array, essentially unmapping it from the address space. The key to how this memory mapper is going to work 
is that we're essentially going to copy some of the data view interface. We're going to implement a get uint16 method, a set uint16 method, and any of the other methods that we use within the CPU class. Let's start with a get uint16. That method gets the address as an argument, so we need to find the region that this address maps to. Since we're going to do that for every get and set type, we can write a method for it. Essentially, we need to search through each region using array find, where the address is between the start and the endpoints of the region. If we don't find a region, then we'll throw an error. This will, of course, happen if some of our address space is unmapped, but the CPU still tries to read or write from it. Finally, we'll return the region that we found. So now we have a region, we can ask that region to get the uint16 at that address. But first, we should check if we should remap the address. Address remapping allows us to decouple where the device is mapped in memory from the addresses that that device actually uses. Imagine we had 100 bytes of memory and we mapped it starting at address 1000. That means it will cover all the addresses from 1000 to 1080. But internally, that memory uses addresses that go from 00 to 80. So when we remap the address, we subtract the start address from the address we're trying to get. Finally, we need to return the result of calling region.device.getUN16 on the final address we calculated by remapping. And that's it. But we need to do exactly the same thing for getUint8, setUint16, and setUint8. And eventually, we'll need to do a similar thing with all the methods that deal with signed values, but for now, we're not using those. From this file, we can export the memory mapper class. Let's go to the index.js file and use our memory mapper class with the CPU. We'll import memory mapper and create an instance called mm. After we create our 256 by 256 bytes of memory, we can map it to addresses starting at 0 and ending at fffff, which is, of course, just the entire address space. So far, this is exactly the same as what we had before. Let's now map 256 bytes of the address space to something that we'll call a screen device. We'll somehow create this with a function called create screen device, and it will be mapped from address 3000 to 30FF, and we will set the remap argument to true so the addresses that end up going to this device actually go from 0 to FF. Then we can pass MM to the CPU instead of just the memory. All right, so I'll create a new file here called screen device. We'll create a function which will return an object, and this object needs to implement our partial data view interface. The screen device is only going to respond to writes. If we try to read a 16 or an 8-bit value from here, we'll just return 0. But if we try to write an unsigned 16-bit value, then we're going to do something else. This function receives first an address and then some data. The bottom byte of this data is going to be the numerical value for a printable character. For example, the numerical value for the character capital A is 65. As we saw in the beginning, the screen device is essentially a 16 by 16 grid of characters, and each possible address from 0 to FF maps to one cell of this grid. So when we write to an address on this device, we're actually choosing where to place the character. How do we turn our one-dimensional address into a two-dimensional pair of coordinates? Well, it turns out there's a well-known formula for this. We can get the x position from the address modulo 16, which is the width of our grid. And similarly, the y position can be calculated by taking the address 
divided by 16 and rounded down. Now that we have a position to work with, we need to move the cursor to that position. I'll put that in a function called move to, which we'll write in a moment, with x and y. Now all move to is going to do is to print a special escape sequence to standard output. If you don't know about escape sequences, they're basically a way to communicate with the terminal by printing messages which are actually instructions rather than characters. You'll find a link to a bunch of different escape codes in the description, but for now, in order to move the cursor, we need to use this escape code, which lets us first set the Y position and then the X position. Now one tricky thing here is that the coordinate system of the terminal starts at 1, so we need to add 1 to both the X and the Y position. Also, in order to get this to print nicely, we should multiply the X coordinate by 2. And this is actually just because the height of the lines in the terminal are twice the size of the characters themselves. So if we do this, it spreads everything out into more or less a square. Now, after exporting the function, after five episodes, we're finally ready to write a Hello World program. Going back to index.js, we can delete the old program that we had, along with all the debugging code we wrote to view the registers and the stack, and replace it with a super simple program that demonstrates how this works. First, we need to move a literal value into a register, because right now we can't write memory directly. The high byte will be zero, and the low byte will be the character code of capital letter H. And we'll put that into R1. Next, we can move R1 to memory. The address will be 3000, which of course maps to the first cell in our screen device. We'll finish this program off with a halt instruction and then call cpu.run. If we take a look in the terminal, sure enough, capital letter H does appear. But we want the whole greeting, so let's wrap this machine code up into a function called write char to screen which takes a character and a position. We can swap the explicit h for the character that we've passed in and the low byte of the address with the position. We take the string hello world, split it into an array, and then for every character in the array, we'll call write char to screen with its character and the position, which will generate machine code for every letter in hello world. Running that in the terminal, we see the glorious text. Even though this can be achieved in a single line of JavaScript, this is quite monumental for the VM. And just so it's crystal clear how this display is actually working, let's replace the Hello World example with a program that writes a star character to every one of the 256 cells of the grid by iterating from 0 to FF. This looks pretty cool, but at the same time, a bit weird. Because we're moving the cursor around on the screen, we're actually overwriting the text that's already there. And you might have noticed that we're kind of wasting some resources here. The high byte of the 16-bit value when we write to the screen is completely unused. We're just placing zeros there now. We can use that high byte for a sort of command or a message that the screen device can process. For example, we might want to clear the entire screen so that we don't get a weird text overlapping effect. Let's revisit screendevice.js to implement that. We can extract a variable called command by getting the high byte of the value being written to the screen device. If that command is equal to ff, then perhaps we want to erase the entire screen. Just like moving around, erasing the screen is also accomplished by sending an escape sequence. Now you might notice a funny parallel with what we're doing here in memory mapping with the address space to what the terminal is doing with these escape sequences. It's taking the common interface of writing text and using it to do other things instead. Now, there are a lot of different possible commands that we could implement, but I'll add just a couple more here. We could, for example, set the screen device to output bold text. 
and we can do the reverse, going back to regular text. Let's go back and use some of those commands in our machine code. We'll add a command argument to right chart a screen and then insert the value into the high byte. Now, when we loop through to print the stars, we can create a command variable that says if the index is an even number, then we will print text in bold. Otherwise, we'll use regular formatting. Lastly, we can clear the entire screen with the ff command before we print the stars. And voila, no more weird text overlapping effect, and we have some of the stars in bold. So with this set up, the VM is starting to come to life, but there are some things that this machine needs before it will be comfortable to create something like a game. First of all, we're missing an actual assembly language for expressing complex programs. Programming machine code byte by byte in JavaScript is definitely not ideal. And on top of that, the VM is still missing a lot of the instructions that it should have in order to write real complex programs. In the next few episodes, I'm really excited to start working on these problems, adding instructions to juice up the machine, and finally, to begin to design and implement the assembly language for expressing complex programs. I want to say a massive thank you to all the patrons and give a special shout out to Max Starr, who has been working on an IDE slash debugger for the VM. You can find links to his project and some others who are implementing their own VMs with various languages and constraints in the description below. And if you're looking to get your hands dirty on this stuff, then you might want to contribute to some of these open source projects. You can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash low level JavaScript. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.